So hey, I'm Andrew Dobie and this is Lewis Phillips. Welcome to episode 11 of Just a Chat With, a video podcast series where we talk about branding and creativity with the world's best in class. Last month we were down in London with design legend Michael Wolfe, so make sure and check that out if you have not already. Or go watch it again if you have. Um, we also had Gavin Strange on the show recently at Argman Animations. Um, we've had Marty Neumeyer, Noah Klokek from Pixar and loads more. Today we're sitting down with none other than James White in the brand new Made Brave studio here in Glasgow in Scotland. It's complete with new Just a Chat neon sign. Pretty cool, right? What do you think, James? It's killer. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> So James is an amazing and very well-known digital artist, designer, and speaker. He is also the founder of Signal Noise Studio, which is based in Newcastle in England. James has gained loads of recognition in the industry for his various neon-infused art projects. James has worked for some of the most amazing brands, such as Toyota, Universal Music, Nike, Metallica, who I love, Warner Brothers, Twitch, and many, many more. Uh, James, thanks for being here. A pleasure to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. So, first of all, could you tell us for, well, I suppose for the viewers who don't know much about you, can you maybe give us a little synopsis of who you are and what you do in your own words? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a Canadian, if you couldn't tell from my weird accent. And uh, yeah, just relocated over to Newcastle upon Tyne. And uh, I'm a digital artist and illustrator. Like you said, I like uh, neon infused stuff, 1980s style, that kind of thing. Um, I run the Signal Noise Studio, and I've been doing that since 2010 full time, but I've been in the industry since 1998. Uh, as a professional designer. I'm sure we'll get into some of those stories. Started out as a web designer and that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I use Illustrator, I use Photoshop, and I use a sketchbook. I think that sums it up a little bit. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, so, so what, what, what are you working on at the moment? What's, what's keeping you busy just now? Yeah, uh, well, it's 2020. Happy New Year, guys. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this year, um, you know, yeah, the new decade, yeah. And uh, this year I decided, you know, I'm doing, I'm going to be doing things a little bit differently than I have been over the last 10 years. I made a lot of New Year's resolutions or goals or whatever. So the stuff I'm working on now is, um, is this uh, the independent publication that we have in front of us here, Off the Grid, my independent art zine. It's a 40-page uh, independent publication with, uh, with uh, all my artwork from uh, throughout the years. I dive into my archive a lot to publish a lot of the stories and artwork and uh, try, to, try to sort of illuminate a little bit of the history behind what I've been doing, why I've been doing it, who I've been doing it for, that kind of stuff, and, um, and trying to show that undercurrent of uh, personal artwork that informs some of the client work that I do. So working on Off the Grid is one of the things I'm doing now. Um, trying to draw a lot more, um, trying to get away from the digital space a little bit to get back to like analog drawing. And, uh, and I'm in the early stage of, uh, of starting my uh, YouTube channel, which nice. is really fun. And uh, I'm going to have some tech questions for you guys after this podcast about all this stuff that's set up. Now that we've got it all working. Now we've yep. got it all working. Yeah, you guys <laughs> seem to know what you're doing. So. Only took us four hours. Yeah, yeah it's, so. it was four hours well spent. <laughs> <laughs> but, and so what's uh, the YouTube channel for anyone that's going to be looking for it? Yeah, it's um, it's just going to be like uh, the, under the Signal Noise banner. It's going to be the Signal Noise broadcast. Um, I did a, a broadcast like ten years ago, and I used UStream for that. And uh, it was in the early, early days of streaming live online, and um, did like an hour long show weekly, just uh, getting questions from the audience that was there, the live, the chat room, and uh, kind of a back and forth, and showing a little bit of demos on how to do stuff. But the new the YouTube channel is going to be an extension of that, but it's going to be uh, things like hyperlapse drawings, like I said, I wanted to get back into my drawing, my roots kind of thing. So a lot of hyperlapse drawings recording me as I'm inking and drawing and stuff. Uh, doing the same for the digital space, so I might record, like, do some screenshots or screen recording of uh, noodling around in Illustrator and Photoshop and building an art piece. And, uh, and ultimately, um, some informative stuff, like uh, tips and tricks to, to do our jobs better. Uh, and kind of diving into the uh, why we do what we do other than the how yeah. we do like I don't I'm not interested in doing tutorials or or that kind of thing I'm, I'm more interested in like why we as creative people do the things that we do why we pursue the things that we do and, and how we do it ultimately because it's a big very weird space that we live in where we can go in any direction at any given time so trying to illuminate what my path was in hopes that it would help 
uh, people getting into the industry or, or veterans alike, who knows, try to find their creative voice, trying to find what path they want to be on and what they should be on and the kind of work that they want to do and whether they want to do that for clients or they want to do that for themselves. So kind of, and diving a lot into my archives because I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here. I apologize, but, uh, I have, um, I have uh, like an archive of my work at home, which is, uh, an unbroken, line of drawings and sketchbooks that reach back to 1988 or 1989. So I have it all. And I'm very fortunate that, you know, I didn't throw any of that out. And my parents never threw any of that out. I mean, my, my parents knew from a really young age that I loved drawing. So in a, in a ploy to make me clean up my room, uh, I remember dad walking in and, and giving me this big like envelope. He probably, he was in the military. So he just got this big envelope from work and he brought it home and he said, Hey bud, whenever you do a drawing, why not, you know, keep it in this envelope? That way you can keep them all together and keep them organized, which was probably a ploy to make me clean up my room. <laughs> but in that small gesture allowed me to retain all of those drawings throughout the years. And, you know, uh, then when I moved into sketchbooks in 95, I have all of those sketchbooks too. So the, the YouTube channel is also going to try for me to try to cast light on how long creative people do what they do. You know, it doesn't start when you start your career or when you start your schooling when you're 18 or whatever. Like most nine times out of 10, people that are in this industry have been doing this for a very long time, have been, have been growing up with pencils and sketchbooks and colored and like colored pencils, markers, that kind of thing. And I, I'm very fortunate that I have all of that. So I can not only talk about that lineage, but I can show it as well. And in just in hopes of um, offering a space online that, uh, you know, fledgling artists or, or experienced artists alike can uh, can identify with, and uh, and for me, it's just fun. You know, I like diving into that stuff. If we if we take it right back to the eighties, yeah, like what's how did you start? Like, so you were drawing, and then wh where did you go? Yeah, I ever since I could pick up a pencil, age of four, I started drawing, and it, it essentially never stopped. How old are you now? Um, I'm 42. 42. Yeah, I was born in 1977. The 80s were my like you know formative years when I was a kid, and so I was a typical boy in the 1980s. So I was you know into He-Man and Transformers and GI Joe. Um, cartoons a lot, like, and redrawing cartoons. So my mom couldn't keep the good typewriter paper in the house. So I would find it and I would draw on it all. Um, and w once I started doing that, it kind of, it, be, it not so much became an obsession, it just became my pastime, you know? It, it all, drawing always ran alongside all of the stuff that I was into back in the mm. 80s, like video games, like uh, cartoons, movies, toys, um, you know, and I remember, and my buddy, I got to give a big shout out to my buddy, Mike Field, who lives back in Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, he and I were, uh, were best friends, you know, back in the, back in the eighties, we met in grade five and he got me into wrestling. He got me into like a lot of the movies that I was into video games. Like we were right at the right time when the Super Nintendo came out. And he was also, he drew a lot too. So we, both of us would start drawing uh, wrestlers. We wanted to invent our own wrestlers. So yep. even at that very young age, we were into character design. And, uh, and both of us did that. So whatever we were into, comic books, we would inevitably start drawing those. So comic book characters and whatever. And, uh, and that's, that's essentially how it went, you mm. know? Like, and, and it's all about, and again, this is, again, the broad sphere of growing up being a, being a creative person. Like, there are certain beats that we hit along the way that if we didn't hit those, our path would be way different. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, uh, Christmas... Uh, 1986, I believe it was, my parents gave me this big set of markers. It was basically the full spectrum, and it was this big, like, binder that you would open up, and it had loads of uh, markers in it. And um, that was important because that gave me access to more than the eight colors I was used to. It was <laughs> like, now yeah. I, could, I could illustrate anything I wanted. I could draw whatever cartoon character, and I'd have the color there. Um, and it, that was an important beat, you know? And there's so many of those, and everybody's beats are different growing up that just keeps us on that creative path. Um, so yeah, that was a, that was a, a big one. Mm -hmm. Winning a coloring contest in grade three was a big one too. I won 30 Canadian dollars and I bought a Knight Rider car with it. So you could say I bought my first car when I was <laughs> eight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and where did it, you know, I suppose you started, you really expressing yourself. It was complimentary to your interests. It was a hobby. Like where did it become a profession? Yeah, a profession. Now this is weird. Um, because 
all this time, like, again, drawing all the way through elementary school, junior high, high school, up to grade 12, I never thought, other than the pipe dream of, like, me and Mike saying, we're going to draw comics when we grow up, um, we never, or I didn't, I, I won't speak for Mike, but I never thought that I could do something like that for a living. It just never occurred to me because I never knew exactly what illustrators did other than draw comics. I had no mm -hmm. idea. I honestly thought that the only job I could get was like a courtroom sketch artist. <laughs> you know, th that they, yeah. they sketch what's going on in a courtroom. I thought that was the only job I could get. Or no, the, I'm sorry. Or uh, the person that works at a police station that like would you describe <laughs> the per the crook to them and they illustrate yeah. what they look like. You I draw them that. with a cape and like no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All muscle bound every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a Ninja Turtles mask. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't think that I could do something creative for a job. So at the end of high school, um, this will loop into the question you asked. At the end of high school. I went to my guidance counselor, and at that point, I wanted to be a police officer, which is just like the most opposite of a creative job. And um, and I, I probably wanted to do that because my dad was a dispatcher for the for the Toronto Police Department. And I told the guidance counselor this, and he said, "Well, you can't do that because your grades aren't good enough." Like I didn't do. If I always say, if there was a grade thirteen, I would have failed it. <laughs> um, so he said, you can't do that. And he said, what are your interests? Because he's a guidance counselor, you know, and, and that's what he's supposed to ask. And I said, well, I do, a lot of, I do a lot of drawing and stuff, like for the school newspaper and whatever at that time. And he said, oh, have you ever considered graphic design? And I said, what's that? I had no idea. I didn't know what a logo was, you know. So he pulled out a pamphlet for the Nova Scotia Community College, the Truro <laughs> campus, uh, really small small college in my hometown, and he said, like, check this out, and there was a graphic design course. It, would, it happened to be the final time that course was offered in that school. So I looked at it, and I was like, oh, okay. Brought it home and showed my parents, and they're like, are you interested in doing that? Because the first part of the curriculum was uh, drawing. Yeah. I was like, what? I can, do, I, can, like, um, I can be taught to do drawing? Like, I didn't know. Applied and ended up getting in. And so that's essentially where professionally mm. it started. Like, I learned Photoshop and... Uh, I think freehand at that point. So yeah, and that's where I learned to do all this stuff. So essentially, like um, that's when I started to consider graphic design as a profession. And then in 1998 is when I was hired by Internet Solutions in Halifax, Nova Scotia, to design websites mostly in Flash. Yeah. So that's when I that's when I started doing this professionally. Cool. Did you Did you do any macromedia director before Flash? Oh, you want to you want me, you want to get me going about director, <laughs> do you? <laughs> Bitch director, man. It, it's uh, <laughs> we hated it, and I got to give uh, I got to give a uh, a shout out to my buddies Ryan Grant and Chris Toms back home mm -hmm. because we hated director lingo. Yeah, it was the worst, wasn't it? Oh man, and we were we were uh, we were the go to frame <laughs> artists, and that's all we knew how to do. So just we, we tried to hide stuff in the timeline, just go to frame, go to frame, so we wouldn't have to write any of the complicated math stuff. I was telling Lewis at one point that um, I remember having a PC, and you had. You know, you had director, you had Photoshop, you had Illustrator. And if you wanted to change between these programs, you had to un uninstall two out of three of them. <laughs> like, so you could only install one at a time. So you would do something in Illustrator and you go like, I need to get that into Photoshop. Uninstall Illustrator. That's it, insane. It would take like an hour, <laughs> reinstall it, and then come on and do the next bit. <laughs> How did they think that was a good... A good it, mechanism. It just wasn't. It just wasn't <laughs> enough RAM. There wasn't enough anything to do anything. So. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's horrible. <laughs> now, jumping back a bit, yep. I want to go back to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Magic words, man. So I'm, I'm like, I'm similar ages. I'm 38, and yeah, right. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is where a lot of my early creativity came from. And I believe you still like to draw the Ninja Turtles. Absolutely. Talk us through that. Yeah. Okay, so the Turtles... Man, where do I start on the turtles? Oh, man. So, again, I was at the perfect age. Both yeah. of us were when the turtles hit. Uh, maybe I was a little bit too old, but I still love them. Uh, so this would have been, what, 88 or something? 89 when they hit. So, and again, like, I was drawing cartoons all over the place at that point and started drawing. Michelangelo, of course, was my favorite. And, uh, you know. Donatello for me. It's Donatello. Donatello. All right. Yeah. You like the smart guy? I like the <laughs> surfer dude. Okay. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> But yeah, Lewis, where were you in that? Which not really. Like, no, no, my thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no offense. Right. So you're a foot soldier. Take a, take a, take a seat for thirty minutes. <laughs> no, just, we'll be yeah. right back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, started drawing uh, Ninja Turtles all over the place, and still do. Like I said to this day, there's actually one of them in one of these zines. I think in the very first one, there's my old uh, Michelangelo drawing. But uh, 
at the perfect age when that landed, and it was like these colorful, uh, what anthropomorphic characters, like super fun and wildly popular. The toys were everywhere, and when the movie hit in 1990, like I was all over that movie. Yeah. I was, I don't like to date. I don't think there was a movie I, I was more excited for than to see the Ninja Turtles live on screen with actual <laughs> people. You it know, was so good, wasn't it? Oh, it was amazing. And to this day, like that movie holds up. It's a, it's a perfect Ninja Turtles movie. I watched it tonight. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah you, you yeah. should. <laughs> it's like my, my son is now eight years old, so he's come to the same oh, age nice. of when I saw it. So I'm like, so I found my old turtle it's figures. Time. Nice. The old originals got them out and got and playing with them. It's, t- <laughs> it's time, <laughs> friendly. And yeah. so I'm getting to relive it all again. It's, awesome. It's amazing. You know. Yeah, and that's great too because like around that time when the Ninja Turtles movie came out and the Batman movie and that stuff, like 89, 90, uh, me and Mike, again, we would watch these movies, but we didn't have access to the internet, of course. It was it was pre-internet age, so we didn't have photos other than stuff that we happened to buy in magazines or whatever. So I would run home from the theater and try to draw the characters from memory, mm-hmm. you know, just trying to like, I gotta, I gotta try to draw what they looked like. And I have a Ninja Turtle, it's Raphael, yeah. that I drew when I got home from the theater because I wanted to remember like, yeah, the 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 tassels on the masks are way longer and they're more rough and the colors are more desaturated and you know trying to remember all of these things so i can draw it yeah it was, yeah it was a uh, it was so, so you got the cool ones uh like over in america canada because you got ninja turtles we were given hero turtles it was what? Teen- it was called teenage mutant hero turtles here they didn't they didn't think like i, th- I think they thought it was too violent for the British market. Really? Yeah, so you had it as Ninja, we had it as Hero. Oh, yeah, we got the way better version yeah, of that totally. thing. Ninjas are always cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's weird. Like, Hero Turtles, did they fly? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I derailed this whole thing onto Turtles. Hey. But, so, where were we? We were kind of, you've just, you've, uh, you're now at college. Yeah. Yeah. And stuck in Macromedia Director. Stuck in Macromedia <laughs> yeah, Director. Yeah, mired. <laughs> Screaming at Lingo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that was yeah, and that was uh, after graphic design. So uh, just to give uh, like a little bit of an update on that, like graphic design taught me, like you know, introduced me to the computer. Up until that point, I was only using uh, my family's Commodore 128 yeah. at that point, which is basically the upgrade of the 64, or the Commodore yeah. 64. So it's like the dot matrix printer, or the eh, 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 <laughs> which uh, I love that thing. Um, but then actually being able to use Photoshop on a real computer was uh, amazing. I didn't know what that was up until that point. Yep. So learning all of that. And after graphic design, I took a two-year course called Interactive Technology. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, and again, my buddies Ryan and Chris that I mentioned earlier were part of that course. And uh, all of us are still in the industry doing our, our various things. But Interactive Technology taught me, it was a crash course in a lot of tech circa 1997. So CD-ROM kiosks, that's what we were using goddamn director for. And uh, stuff like uh, audio recording, video recording, uh, 3D animation was a part of it. Um, But websites was the biggest thing in Flash. Like that's what essentially got me into the industry a year later in 1998 was the ability to use Flash and animation and that that sort of thing. And a lot of... um, I guess the the problem with iTech at the time, the course, was they didn't offer any design background to the other students. Like, Mm -hmm. me and Ryan were fortunate that we took a year of graphic design before that, and it was just enough to make our projects look a little bit more polished than the the other people in the class because they weren't given that... They didn't have a sense of typography or color theory or structure composition, where your eye flows, that kind of thing. And me and Ryan did have that. And we had a little bit more experience with the tools. It wasn't, graphic design taught us not only how to use Photoshop, but why to use it for specific yeah. things. And that's a big deal, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you can learn the tools, but you gotta learn why, why you're using them a specific, specific way. So um, yeah, and our, our projects just looked a little bit better. We had a, just a couple of feet ahead of the other people in the class, which was uh, essential at the time. And what, what did your work look like back then? Like, were you, were you kind of gravitating towards teal and pink and <laughs> things were getting shiny? <laughs> oh, or no. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, like it was, um, I still have, again, I still have all of that early work too. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the websites I was designing and stuff. And at the time, you know, I was in my early 20s, like late teens, early 20s. And I was really, and I think a lot of people are, you know, I won't speak for anybody else, just my own experience, but we're all very susceptible to the things that we see that we enjoy to, to a more potent degree. So if I really like things like, 
like I'll give a shout out to uh, Prey Station, Joshua Davis over in New York. Like his flash stuff in the late 90s and early 2000s was hugely in, like uh, mm-hmm. influential mm-hmm. on my early work. And that, you know, I would end up, I'll say it, copying his work, <laughs> you know, like emulating what he was doing. And, and there was a number of other, like in that early web time. Like two Advanced Studios, remember that? Two Advanced, yeah. absolutely. Like Designer's Republic mm-hmm. and like all the things like, uh, um, what was that one? Uh, Keoken mm-hmm. over in uh, New York. And like basically anything you'd find on Caliber 10,000, design is kinky. Um, Did you ever play on the beta website, B3TA? Ooh, no. that sounds familiar. I don't know if I did. It was yeah. like this, it's kind of like this old forum and it was like, where the first internet kind of animations and memes. Oh, worked. no way. And like, I went back on it recently. I was showing, telling Lewis about it. And it's like, it's still the same. Get it's out like of here. It's not changed since then. I think oh. they've just kept it. You need to go on it. Like B3TA.com. I'll check it's that like, out. It's just a really playful place where people used to like post something they'd tinkered in Photoshop, but then someone oh. else would do something else. And then something, and it would just like, that's awesome. You'd end in this creative wormhole of stuff. Oh <laughs> man. Well then I think Joshua Davis built, like he did, uh, was it, Dream, uh, oh man, Dreamless, Dreamless.org. That was like a, a message forum that he ran in the early two sure. thousands. That kind of had that same vibe, like yeah. it's the similar description of what you just said. And it's just a bunch of creative people playing off of one another. And uh, you know, it's just such a beautiful time of, mm. of the internet. So to answer your question, no, my stuff didn't look like nineteen eighties <laughs> nonsense that yeah. it does today. It was very uh, whatever I was into at the time. Obey Giant was mm-hmm. a huge influence in my early work. So learning Illustrator and then discovering Obey Giant, his propaganda poster style, uh, Shepard Fairey, um, you know, that was a huge inspiration on my stuff. So a lot of this, uh, and again, I have this all in the archive, and this is the kind of stuff I want to touch mm-hmm. on in the YouTube channel to show mm-hmm. a cre- the creative trajectory of somebody like trying to navigate mm-hmm. this industry without, there's no rule book to any of this, mm-hmm. right? And I'm sure you two are the exact same way in that you just have to figure it out yeah. for your for yourself. You know, there's no one right way. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and uh, th- so for me, it, it came through, like building skills came through emulation yeah. a lot, like copying other people's styles, copying their ideas and trying to figure out how they did stuff um, in, in, in hopes of eventually finding my own voice, but yeah. more importantly, building the skills that are needed in order to even do that. Yeah. Michael Wolf talked a little bit about that in his last, uh, our last podcast. Uh, he was talking about how kind of, it's kind of a progression you kind of have to go through is like you emulate other artists first right. until you can kind of understand your own voice. And then like, once you know that and you have your own kind of purpose, it's like, just do more of that. Exactly. Know, but, but it's kind of almost a process that you kind of need to go through. So it was kind of, you had to do the turtle thing, copy those turtles. Absolutely. <laughs> you have Absolutely. to go through all this, all the rooms, I think he called it, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All the, uh, that's a good analogy. That's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, you figure out what those skills are and you figure out ultimately what you enjoy, right? And, uh, you know, I've been, I've been tossing around this idea over the last little while because I think it's relevant to where I am in my career. Like, we all, we get to the point Actually, Einstein said this way back in the day. He said, a problem needs to get super complicated before it can be elegantly simplified. And Mm -hmm. where I am in my career, and I've done this a a few times, is you take, like, let's say the the 10 year, a 10 year span, like you take what you've learned and the things you explored within that 10 years and you simplify it, you consolidate the things that worked and you get rid of the things that didn't Mm -hmm. and something new might emerge from that. And it's this consolidation. And that's what I'm doing with my zine is I'm consolidating all of this stuff to build something new out of it. And that's yeah. in the form of a physical publication. Um, where, that, where can people find these if they want to, you know, people oh, yeah. grab one of these? Where can, where can they get one? Yeah, uh, store.signalnoise.com. Cool. And, yeah. how, and how often are they coming out, James? Uh, they're quarterly. Quarterly. Yeah, cool. so I'm going to have one every four, every mm, three months. Okay. And uh, the, ne- the next one is due out in mid, uh, mid-March, mid issue three. Cool. We will pop a link in the comments below so Thank anyone you. that's listening can go jump and find that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Cool. Right on. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's sort of the idea that I'm tossing around. It's this consolidation of a lot of the stuff. And, you know, I, I managed to do that inadvertently when I was 30. So the 10 years before that, and I'm kind of going through the same process now of re-examining, uh, where where I've been, because now, like being older, we have mm. the benefit of time. We can look back and see our path and sort of pick out what didn't work. And, and uh, no, th- I, I think that's like common language for artists. You know, I think everybody should kind of check out where they've been mm. in order to figure out where they want to go. Yeah. Have you always kind of had quite a wide interest in different disciplines? You know, like it sounds like at that point in your career, you were in the mind of a designer, but you were doing interactive stuff, you were doing web, you were probably still illustrating lots. Yeah. You know, like what, how do you, how do you kind of like, is are you, would you describe yourself as a generalist or, or somebody that kind of 
mm. has their medium. Uh, yeah, I think earlier in my career, I'd say I was more of a generalist. Like I did painting, I, I tried sculpting, and that that fell apart literally. Um, but uh, I think I've I've explored things that are are peripheral, like those. But I've always always gravitated toward the sketchbook. That's always been the constant throughout the whole uh, the whole time. So even when I was designing websites, if I was doing something in Flash or, or a new portfolio site, like signalnoise.com, I registered in 1999 and went through a load of unfinished iterations for a decade mm -hmm. or eight years or whatever it was. And there's so many, I still have all of those designs. So exploring things, but it always came back to illustration. It always came back to, you know, I knew that was my strong suit. I wasn't meant to be a developer um, because I'm just not good at it. I'm not meant to be an animator because I'm just not good at it. Yeah. Um, but illustration, the single static image, is something that I've always been interested in and I've always explored. So everything that I did revolved around that static idea. So illustration, um, of course, there's a number of different styles over the years I've been uh, interested in, but that was, like I said, being susceptible to things that I enjoyed. There's a, an artist, uh, Dave McKeon, who did the... the Notably for me, the uh, the Sandman covers for the comic series by Neil Gaiman back in the back in the nineties, eighties and nineties, and he was a huge inspiration on my early digital work, where it's a lot of photo collaging and weird macabre stuff. Um, that was something I was really interested in, and that stuff didn't really it wasn't my voice I was mm -hmm. dictating. It was it was an emulation of his. So, in stylistically, yeah, I was a more of a generalist back in the back in the early days of my career, exploring different things because I want to figure out: Do I like doing this particular style? Mm -hmm. Does it say something? Does it resonate with me, or is it just a cool one-off thing that I won't touch again? And mm -hmm. you know, and some of these things I'd come back to throughout my career: the Dave McKeon style, the Shepard Fairey style, to mm -hmm. see like, is there something I can do that will make this more my own? And not just something that when people see it go like, "Hey, obey giant," you know, like that's mm. that's ultimately what you want to get away from. And but you have to go through those things to figure out what's up, and then you end up combining those things and chopping them up and pulling different things and elements and combining them into something new. And um, yeah, so in terms of medium, mm -hmm. sort of a generalist early on, but uh, not so much anymore. I mean, I, I've I've even cut out like I used to play guitar. Mm -hmm. in my in like my early 20s because you know I was into Nirvana and mm -hmm. stuff like that and I was like yeah I want to play guitar too and you know it got to a point where I was like mm, I can't nah you know I, I if I want to dedicate my life to something it's going to be drawing and illustration so mm -hmm. I'm just like I'm I came to a point where I cut out a lot of the stuff I was doing not because I wasn't enjoying it but just because this is my focus yeah, and yeah. if I if I don't put time into this then I don't I don't want to be a jack of all trades. I want to be yep. real good at that one thing I really love. So no, cool. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So I suppose for you know we've got a lot of creative people that listen to this podcast, a lot of designers, a lot of illustrators, and it's very hard to get out of that early thing where you have to you're trying to be a little bit good at everything, right? And you're trying to figure out what's my thing. You know, I remember for years, you know, in my early twenties, trying to go. People seem to have a thing, you know, like. You've got this neon thing now. You've got this kind right. of look, this feel, um, and it's very hard to get there. Or for some people, it's some sure. people land on it really quickly. Um, and I suppose for anyone listening who maybe feel like they're stuck in that that area where they've, you know, they're just, I suppose, um, answering briefs that come to them that are not coming to them for the maybe the right reasons. How do you get from there to setting a style? that's yours and finding that and then attracting that work. Yeah. yeah. Holy moly. <laughs> that's a big question, dude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, it's a complicated one and I can only talk about it from my experience, yeah. which is in no way correct. No, of course. You know, it's a, it's a hell of a lot of luck to begin with. Um, and for me, uh, going through like, uh, just springboarding off of the question you just asked about generalist and style mm -hmm. and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Like, uh, when you go through all of that and you're chopping things up and experimenting with it, personally, I got to a point where, like, th there's a lot of frustration mingled in with all of those stories, too, because I was never happy with, like, you know, why is it I can look at a picture of Spider-Man and draw it fairly well, but when I try to draw Spider-Man not looking at anything, it looks like a turd, you know? <laughs> why is that? And I could never understand that when I was a teenager, and that that went into... Uh, my 20s with digital like uh, Flash and Illustrator and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So when you're when you're doing that, you you get to a point where you're so frustrated that 
You just don't want to do any of that. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to, what do I want to do? You know, when you sit in a quiet room for an hour and you kind of think like, well, what am I into? And it took me to like through years of illustrating like skulls and trying to be badass and whatever else to realize like, well, I, I still love Transformers. <laughs> like, why can't I just do that? You know, like hiding this, yeah. like, you know. Pretending to be an adult. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's like, well, why can't I just do this? You know, like I love Metallica's Ride the Lightning cover because of that chrome, yes. the chrome logo. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Like well, nobody's doing that. Why is like, you know, and it's it's one thing that I never subscribed to was that designers are this like, you know, black rim glasses, turtleneck wearing, <laughs> like, oh, well, it'll design will save the world. Like, I've never really subscribed to that. Um, yes, it's essential, but I never subscribed to this this idea that designers are some kind of elite thing. You know, I and yeah. I was just like, well, I just want to run around and be inspired by Judas Priest. Can I do that? <laughs> so I just did, yeah. you know? And I think it's, you know, I guess if there's any nuggets in there, it's that, like, you have to sort of relinquish a little bit of your... Um, frustration and caring about it mm -hmm. and just do your like you know it's, it's trendy to say like just do you mm. or whatever but there is a lot of truth in that and you just got to figure out what you truly want to do because that's ultimately what the world wants you know jk rowling could have just been like a ghostwriter for romance novels or whatever but she had a voice and she had an idea that she wanted to pursue because it was original yeah and she was rejected by loads of people until it was finally accepted and now we have harry potter you know and it's she was doing what she wanted to do and and you know that idea mixed with you know the technology at the time because this was like the Flickr days is when mm -hmm. i started posting my stuff so that through Flickr pools, yeah. it got accepted to online like design blogs mm -hmm. like Abdezito, my buddy Fabio, mm -hmm. and uh, and that proliferated through there. So and then social media kicked up a storm, and then like everyone jumped to Twitter, and that was just used as another vehicle to spread artwork um, mm -hmm. in those early days. So it's a little bit of uh, technology and a whole lot of luck in mm -hmm. the right place, right time, mm -hmm. and developing something that resonates with an audience and it's something that you know and I, I hesitate to tell the story as any form of advice because it's not really advice you know it's it's it, the wwe let's bring this back to wrestling guys come on <laughs> yeah. um the wwe could not have written stone cold steve austin in yeah. the way that it resonated with the audience they could not have let's give it as original name wwf for, okay. For those you. for those old enough. Yeah, that's before right. Before it was WWE, it yeah. was WWE. Before they were sued by pandas, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, like it's uh, let's go WWF. You're yeah. right. Um, so the WWF could not have written yeah. Stone Cold Steve Austin. That that's lightning in a bottle. It was mm. the right place, the right time. It was where society was at the time. It was where uh, wrestling was at the time, and it's what people wanted to see. What pop? What it wasn't a response to pop culture. It ended up dictating it. Yeah. And with a style that resonates, like you can't plan that. You just can't do it, you know? Like uh, Shepard Ferry couldn't have planned that when he was making, where he would end up being with Obey Giant when he was making those little black and white stickers back in the late 80s. He wouldn't, he could never have dreamed that yeah. it would have been where it is now. And it's just, it's, it's a lot of luck and it's right place, right time. So anyway, yeah, to answer your question, like that's that's my trajectory mm -hmm. and that's just how i ended up garnering this voice for myself because ultimately i just wanted to do what was fun for me without really uh trying to make something that would capitalize on a trend or something like yeah. that um I was yeah, just you've got to kind of try and capture what's you and then start doing it on purpose right yeah that's totally kind of and right. that's just it and when yeah. you start doing something and it's also like a Aaron Draplin, a friend of mine from out in Portland, really notable designer, really good guy. You guys should totally get him on the podcast, by the way. We want him. Draplin, if you're listening. <laughs> Excellent. You're next. I vouch for Draplin. <laughs> He'll set you guys straight. <laughs> uh, he said, when, the, when they call you to the big leagues, be ready. Mm -hmm. And for me, I translated that as, for my own work, I translate that as when you know that something is resonating with an audience, mm -hmm. keep pursuing it and keep pushing it. Mm -hmm. Because those those people that are interested in it might tell people about it and it might proliferate from there. So like mm -hmm. be ready, have your website ready, have your portfolio ready, get on the social media, mm -hmm. have stuff like in the sketchbook sketched out that you wanna create that's along that same creative mm -hmm. line. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what I did in like, the, uh, in like 2008, 2009, when I noticed that this retro thing that I was doing was resonating with yeah. people. 
I just kept doing all it. In. Yeah. Absolutely. And mm-hmm. talking about it. How did I do it? And the enthusiasm that I had while making it, what it was inspired by. And, uh, you know, and it just, it, it kind of snowballed from there. Mm. Kind of will it into happening. Sort of. Yeah. 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 And it's, <laughs> and like, it, there, and it became a goal at that point. Like, how far can I push this? And here we are 10 years later, and it's still, it's still something that I'm doing professionally. So, yeah. 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 And again, it's just the right place, right time, and a lot of luck. And it's very lucky that we've just kitted out our new studio with neons everywhere. See, yeah, <laughs> you guys are just showing off with this now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so for those listening, we've got a, you know we're about to do a studio launch party, and James is also here to he's going to create the identity for our studio launch party. So we're going to get some really amazing artwork. We're going to be collaborating with Made Brave, our creative brand agency, and Campfire, our content agency, to pull together like the most awesome studio launch party. So oh, man. That's a lot of pressure, man. <laughs> so this, uh, We don't this know what we're doing yet. I mean, this afternoon. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the brainstorm is this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I'm just thinking, this is going live end of January, and the launch party is the end of February. So Sweet. Uh, so um, I want to jump back to Metallica. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Let's do so it. I'm a big Metallica fan, <laughs> and you got to design some posters, some uh, some tour posters for Metallica. Yeah. Tell me more. Just just talk about Metallica and, t- and let's talk about this. How did this come about? All right. Uh, this is a, a big shout out to my buddy Tim Doyle over in over in Texas in the in the US. Uh, he runs Nakatomi Inc. Cool. And uh, he's been a friend of mine for I would say like well online colleague, but I'd call us friends. He might he might dispute. <laughs> 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 but uh, I've been I've been in contact with him for quite some time and we've always wanted to collaborate on something. And yeah. uh, Tim ended up getting the the job as like he runs Nakatomi Inc., which does screen printing posters and stuff. He's been doing it for a cool. number of years, like over a decade, I believe. And he was hired by the people that run Metallica's, I think I believe this is right, that uh, they run Metallica's like marketing and stuff. So they hired mm-hmm. Tim to creative direct the l- the line of gig posters mm. for that tour. So he would have, and Metallica's really old school that way where they would have an original poster for every show, yeah. not just one poster for the whole tour. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they couldn't have gotten anybody better than Tim to do that because Tim has great contact. He does great work on his own. Yep. He does great screen printing, mm-hmm. but he also has a great reach when it comes to artists and yep. uh, really inclusive with who he chooses to do these things as well. So uh, yeah, he, he ended up getting a hold of me and said like, do you want to do a, a uh, tour poster for Metallica, and I said, "Yeah, no, of busy, course I do." Busy, nah. It's like I went, "Who?" <laughs> uh, I got a confession though. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't know. Don't say it. Don't no, no, say no. It. I don't know too much about don't Metallica. Me. My buddies, <laughs> I got to give under more shadows to my buddies Jerko and my buddies Nick back home. Okay, Jerko's real name hey, Jerko. is Ian, but we call him <laughs> Jerko. Uh, yeah, those guys are huge Metallica fans, and my buddy Lucas back home as well. Like those guys are are huge Metallica fans. So I cool. think they were more excited that I was doing this than mm-hmm. than I was. But uh, but again. It's Metallica, and everybody knows Metallica, so I was never, ever going to turn that down. Did you get to meet them? I uh, know. Uh. No. But uh, <laughs> Tim told me that the band does personally have to approve all of their designs. So, you know, my hot oh. pink nonsense ended up in <laughs> front of Lars at some point, and he was just like, yeah, well. <laughs> so how, how do I get my hands on one of those posters? <laughs> oh, man. That's a good question. I think I think Tim still has them on his side. I've done two of them. Mm. Uh, one of them is in uh, the zine. I don't know if I published the other one. I don't know if it's there. I got to look in the, I can't remember what order I put in those, but uh, I've done two of them and they're both, and this is a weird thing, they're both yeah. focused around the same character that I designed. It's like this kind of mm-hmm. armored war skeleton thing with big horns mm-hmm. and uh, I don't even have a name for the character, and I don't. But I think I'm going to try to fold him into the Signal Noise universe mm-hmm. at some point. Mm-hmm. Give him a name, like a backstory, and whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things. Another to loop back to the very first question, what I'm working yeah. on this year. That's another thing is building the Signal Noise universe and including characters like mm-hmm. from the Metallica poster into these things. So I kind of try to put like. I've always wanted to illustrate this. This mm-hmm. might be an opportunity to finally illustrate that thing and try to pass it off as an original thing to mm-hmm. Metallica. I hope Metallica's not listening to this. <laughs> Actually, I hope they are for you guys' sake. We hope they are. Metallica, <laughs> you're next on here too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> James, give me a call. Uh, but wow. yeah, yeah. It was it was really fun to do. And and Tim is a wonderful collaborator. Like he uh he's he's really great in like just go crazy, like go wild. Like let's Yeah, let's I was gonna ask that. Is that was that kind of an open brief? Did they just let you do whatever you want to do? One hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they said, like, you know, look at all of the other posters that Metallica has had because they definitely have their own flavor yeah. of uh, of style and visual. So look at that and just don't do anything that's 
outside of that too much, yeah. um, you know, and, and we'll be good. And we fired over, I think, three different concepts and Tim picked one and we ran with it. And he was, you know, Tim stayed out of my hair the whole time during during the development of that idea. And every time I sent it over, he just wrote back like, awesome, awesome. Like, it was great. It was a really, really fun collaboration. And uh, I think Tim Tim is the kind of client that just he hires creative people to allow them to be creative mm -hmm, within mm -hmm. those parameters, which is like, ultimately we want that from everybody we work with. Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, off, oh, this is kind of a, maybe a bit to be taken out, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds CD off the record. <laughs> no, but you, um, I'm sure you did some kind of like identity system for a game. Is that, was that you? Yeah. And you got totally carried away and, it became this really big, complicated, cool thing. Uh, I think that was Trials of the Blood Dragon. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, and it's it wasn't so much complicated. <laughs> it was. Uh, yeah, I dove in and I went. I went crazy with it. Yeah. I had a great time. I worked with. Uh, it was through Ubisoft, but it was with a company called Red Links in uh, ooh, Finland. Oh, I'm sorry, Red Links. If you're, I'm pretty sure you guys are in Finland. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I worked with their awesome team and yeah. uh, they hired me on as a uh, consulting mm -hmm. art director. I think that yeah, was my yeah, title. Remember, yeah. And uh, yeah, and it was going through de developing the logo and the style and yeah. uh, even overall like level atmosphere. And it was great. And they, they said, look, we have six levels. So we need uh, an atmosphere design. And I'm sitting at looking at my sketchbook like, how the hell do you even do this? How did I get myself into this? Like no idea. So I went, right, six, uh, spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. There, uh, and then I started working on that that spectrum system because you know, if, and like, I'm not actually that good at color theory, so I just use all of them. <laughs> so just like that'll work. And, uh, and I remember one of one of our meetings, or one, of, or maybe it was an email, and they wrote back after I sent them that that idea, and they said, "This is exactly the kind of direction we need." <laughs> and I was like, Whew. <laughs> "I have no idea what I'm doing." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that was a fun one though. Yeah. I, lo I loved working on that game. Yeah, uh, I found that really cool because that, that I suppose it was they approached you because of your style, I assume, and they they wanted a bit of you. Um, but it ended up being so much more than just an illustration, right? It ended up being like literally being built into the game engine, and it was part of the environments. So it was part of. That's the right. on-screen graphics, it was, yeah. Yeah, and it was great because they had originally hired me to just to do a logo and a poster because <laughs> I had originally done uh, Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon for Ubisoft and they wanted, this was uh, another Blood Dragon sort of spinoff. So they originally wanted to hire me just to do the logo and the poster. And yeah, and I went crazy and I pitched <laughs> them on like this thing. Well, instead of this, why don't you hire me to do like all of this other stuff? Because I've always wanted to do this. Like I've been, a video, again, Super Nintendo uh, video game kid growing up. And uh, that would have been really fun to be involved in the game to a, a larger degree. And mm -hmm. they were like, yeah, let's do it. And, like, they were awesome. Like, Red Links was, uh, was like, great guys to work with. Like, mm -hmm. really cool bunch, really creative and really open to uh, to new ideas and visuals and stuff. It was super fun. Yeah. Great. Um, so, um, like, in terms of, you know, what does success mean to you? Like, do you feel like... You've peaked. Do you feel like you've still got to hit it? Do you feel like, you know, wh where where's your head at with success? Do you feel like, you know, because, you know, you're very well known now, you're hitting all these amazing clients, all these great jobs. Um, you know, wh what does it mean to you in terms of your life now? Yeah. Success is a hard one, isn't it? Yeah. Like, I think as, as creative people, I mean, the easy answer is inevitably, like, creative people are never satisfied, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I've always not so much feared it, but always tried to avoid being satisfied with, uh, with what I, and that's not a negative thing either. Mm -hmm. Like, um, what, when I do something that's, uh, I've been, um, I've appreciated some of the work I've done from an aesthetic mm -hmm. level because I've achieved a goal or a number of goals or whatever and mm -hmm. say, I really like this piece and I have appreciation for everything I've ever done way back to, you know, 1988 is foolish and embarrassing as some of those things may be. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate where I was at that point and what I was trying to achieve. And I kind of still have that outlook on my work. Um, there's always learning to do. Yeah. There's always something to explore. Mm -hmm. um, so in that in that light, like success is being able to explore that mm -hmm. realm um, without worry of it being compromised by, you know, losing your apartment or not being able to pay bills or something yeah. like that. So I'm very fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in that realm and that I get to explore some of that for clients mm -hmm. while doing that on my own time. Like I'm, it's a, it's a position that I think 
is a level of success, mm -hmm. but it's nowhere near uh, it's nowhere near what I think the broad definition of success is. You know, and I think mm -hmm. I think designers and creative people at large have to define that for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's about exploring that creative realm, I guess, and being able to do that is, is a level of success. Yeah. So is, is yeah. what was the second no, part of that? No, um, I think it's just, you know, it's just, I think it's just interesting to some, you know, some people never feel like they've arrived. Some people feel like, oh, this is me and my groove now and I'm, right. you know, I'm feeling good and I feel like I've got the balance of work life thing happening. And yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think it's funny because like, you know, if, if you don't know you personally, and you've maybe seen yourself speak or um, like I've been in many a uh, client meeting where their Pinterest board has been heavily influenced by your work. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they'll, be, they'll be hearing from my lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and they probably don't even realize that. But, you, you know, like, and so I suppose, yeah, your work is definitely recognizable. It's definitely influential. Um, so it's just, I suppose, it's interesting to hear how you see it. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, let's uh, let's flip it back on on you guys, right? Like, you guys are in this brand new office that's uh, beautifully done. You're still you're still putting it together, some of it. But so, does that translate to successes? You like, ah, it's okay now. Right. No. Yeah. 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 You're you always on that wheel, aren't you? You it's know, like always. a bit of a paradox, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. being you. You don't yeah. really r recognize it in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's mm. that's sort of it, isn't it? Like now that you yeah. have this beautiful new office set up, you got to keep it running. Yeah. yeah. So that's the next the next thing, right? And I think as creative people, we're not supposed to be satisfied. Yeah. You know, we're supposed to be always looking to the next thing because you know that's what we're built to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's mm. nice, isn't it? Because you, you just, I suppose, you never know what the next thing where that next, oh sorry where that next spark comes from and where it's going to take you. You know, like absolutely. A couple of years ago, I. Couldn't have dreamed to be sitting here running a podcast doing this. <laughs> you know, in a year's time, we'll be doing something different as well. You know, so it's yeah, it's cool. I, we've got quite a lot of younger listeners, um, and I suppose for the kind of younger ones trying to break into the creative industries, um, you know, we've all been quite fortunate. You know, we're we're sitting here doing what we do now, and you know, some people listening are still trying to break in there, trying to figure out. Is there any advice for younger James, the uh, 18, 19 year old version of yourself, you know, that you could give now, you know, being an older guy now, you know, right. you know, just um, hitting 40 kind of thing, you know, is there anything you can give the younger listeners um, a bit of advice that you wish you had back then? Yeah. Um, you know, growing up doing this stuff, like I don't have, I don't have any regrets in terms of my creative lineage. So, mm -hmm. um, because I, I am here today because of all of the things that I've done in the past. So, but when I was younger, I had an immense amount of frustration, like I mentioned earlier, like, mm -hmm. and it was frustrated frustration out of like, why can't I create something that's uniquely my own? Why can't I have, you know, my own style or whatever? Yeah. If I could go back in time and give myself some advice, I would reassure that kid that you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's right to feel frustrated because that means you care. Yeah. about what what you're doing so that bit of advice wrapped up in and this goes out to to the younger people listening to the podcast about mm -hmm. like finding your voice and your vision and mm -hmm. and ultimately trying to get into the industry is be relentless about your work mm -hmm. do a lot you know um I think it was Bill Watterson, uh, Calvin and Hobbes illustrator, I said. Love Calvin and Hobbes. It's yeah, it's the best <laughs> comic strip ever created, right? Yeah, and and that so guy, good. I recently read an interview uh, with him, and he said, uh, "You have to fall down a bunch before you can learn to walk." Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, there's some like uh, some really good nuggets in there. You know, you got to do a lot of work that's not up to par mm -hmm. before you can get on doing the good stuff. You're not going to go to the gym once and get ripped. It's going to take a long time to build up your your mass. Yeah. So, and it's the same with, with creativity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for all the people out there, like be ambitious, make a lot of work. Yeah. Like it, don't sit down thinking you're going to create the Mona Lisa in one shot. Mm -hmm. Do four, th do four crappy things in mm -hmm. a week because you get systematically slightly better with, with each one. It may not mm -hmm. be visible from piece to piece, mm -hmm. but when you look back a couple of years later, you'll see that lineage. You'll see the sharpening of that, that skill. Mm -hmm. So just create as much as you can. You know, and uh, be relentless about it. Put it out online, yeah. um, and t and talk about it with enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. You know, because people like positivity. 
you know, we have way too much negativity in the world. Not sure if you guys noticed, <laughs> but uh, we talk about it enthusiastically and, and positively. And looping back to uh, what we were talking about with emulation, mm-hmm. emulation is not bad. Mm-hmm. It gets negative when somebody is emulating somebody else and doesn't call them out. Yeah. You know, like if, if I'm doing something now that's inspired by Dave McKeon, I'll post, I'll post in the thing, this is inspired mm-hmm. by Dave mm-hmm. McKeon. And that diffuses any of the trolls that are going to come after you saying, you're ripping off so-and-so. Like, yeah. just say it. Mm-hmm. It's everybody, everybody emulates just, and just call it out, you know? Yeah. And that, that is a part of your, your uh, step to becoming what you want to be. So make a lot of stuff, be relentless about it, put it out there, whether that's digital, whether it's analog sketching, yeah. whatever. Yeah. yeah, and I love that whole peace and positivity. There's like, you know, there's a lot of negativity out there. <laughs> and like, you know, it's something to be said for just putting out positive energy. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, it doesn't grab headlines, but we need it. Yeah. There was, a, there was a cool video on Vimeo like a few years ago called The Gap. I don't know if you've seen it. Hmm. And it was it basically it was explaining this kind of concept of The Gap. And The Gap is the the bit in between what you think you can make or what you want people to make and what actually happens, what comes out when you try. Right. Um, and the only way of closing The Gap is to practice like you say and um just do stuff right um, but it was, it was cool it's good video was that ira glass by chance it could have been yeah <laughs> i think i think he said something very similar yeah to that. it might be i yeah. think it maybe was a kind of like a voiceover extract or whatever and then it's a, it's a video that goes with it yeah. right yeah, yeah. that is what it comes down to you know it's about like we're, we're all within that void where there's a place we want to get to but we don't know how to get there it's out in the fog yeah. you know and it's about you just gotta you just gotta walk it's the only way to do it. Nobody's going to drop the secret recipe into your lap and say, if you do these five things, you'll be a successful artist. You know, that's it's different for everybody. Yeah. You know, got to find your own way. Well, James, I just want to thank you so much for coming up here today. My pleasure. Um, it's been an absolute delight. Uh, as usual, with every guest, we could sit here for another three hours, <laughs> sure, uh, and talk about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, yeah. Um, thanks to everyone who's been listening. Uh, if you like what you're hearing and you want to support the podcast, please rate and write us a review to help us get the word out. If you've been listening to the podcast, you can also watch the full video version on YouTube. Um, we publish a new episode on the last Monday of every month, so make sure you're subscribed, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> stay, <Woo>! stay rad. <laughs> thanks, James. <laughs>